because we care about that. We, we want to read and listen to that stuff, right? Uh, it's what sells papers, right? And at the end of the day, the news business is and has always been a business, right? Uh, these, these are companies trying to make money by selling you content that you care about. And so uh, the Hearst covers this uh, hugely, right? It gets into Pulitzer's newspapers, it gets into Hearst newspapers, it, gets, it goes all over the media. And so it's one of those things that if you're McKinley, you don't even crap about this, but all of a sudden there are these protest marches happening. People are sort of like in New York City going up and down Fifth Avenue shouting that the, 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 the Spanish have to be stopped. They're sort of harassing innocent women on American steamers. It turns out the whole story didn't didn't really happen this way. There, she wasn't really strip searched, and she wasn't really searched, and it turns out that she really actually was known to the Spanish government, and it was really kind of above board, and uh, it was all kind of legal. Uh, but the, the idea of sort of being outraged at the evil Spanish and their horrible you know, actions, uh, it sort of it, it changes public opinion. And so you end up with McKinley being in a position where he doesn't actually want to have anything to do with the Spanish uh, government. He don't actually want to go to war with them, but like popular opinion is demanding that you do something. Right? Like, do something about this, because if you don't, like, how can we just do nothing? And so McKinley bows to public pressure on uh, in, in, in early 1898. And he says, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to send an American battleship, the USS Maine, down to Havana Bay to sort of intimidate the Spanish and let them know who's in charge of this, sort of who's sort of let them know who's business down here, right? And so we're going to send the USS Maine down there and just sort of wave the flag and tell the Spanish, we're kind of watching you. Stop screwing around, right? Uh, and if you're McKinley, I'm sure you figure, first, this is a completely meaningless gesture, right? Is the Maine going to do anything? Yeah, sail into the harbor, everybody waves, have a good leave, right? And then you can say, I did a thing. We sent the Maine, we, sent, we did a thing. Stop yelling at me, I did a thing. But hopefully it'll turn out to be a completely just sort of nice gesture, right? I knock on the door, open the door, I say, are you okay? You say yes, and I shut the door, and you go back to which trip, right? And no one cares, right? But if you're the Spanish, what would be the ideal circumstance for the Maine? What would you want to have happen to the Maine in Havana Bay? Absolutely nothing, right? Let the Maine sail into Havana Bay, friendly smiles and waves, sail away untroubled completely, and the Americans can pretend that they that did a thing that mattered, and you can go back to butchering uh, Cubans in the jungle, right? And so it turns out on February 15, 1898, the Maine is in Havana Bay, and what actually happens uh, is this. Uh, where, where's my picture? There it is. Uh, there is the USS Maine, which blew up in the middle of the ship, split in half, flipped over, sunk, and killed like a couple hundred people instantly. Uh, and so uh, immediately the cry goes up, remember the Maine, right? Because uh, with the Maine, what happened is they had an explosion of midships in the middle of the ship. Uh, the ship split in half and sank instantly and killed everybody. Uh, and so first, let's take a moment. What, pro what, like, what conclusion, you, we don't know if it happened for sure or not, but what obvious conclusion do we have to at least consider? The, the Cubans or the Spanish, right? It's the Spanish, it's the Spanish, yeah. Uh, so the Spanish, the Spanish sunk the Maine. Now uh, we have to at least consider that possibility, and we should say, if the Spanish sunk the USS Maine, what do we have to do? Go to war with Spain, right? We're going to jack up Spain because you can't sink American naval vessels and walk away from that, right? On the other hand, there's a number of reasons why we suggest it would be extremely stupid of the Spanish to have sunk. The, uh, the main. That's why you might think the Cubans did it to frame the Spanish, right? Uh, and then you have to at least consider that that might not have actually happened, right? Uh, and so uh, it, may, it does make some sense to suggest that the Spanish would not have wanted this to happen. So that the fact that it happened, we have to at least consider the possibility that it was someone else, it was an accident, something like that, right? Uh, we should mention, by the way, in the real world, there are at least a few people who consider, and now we know pretty definitively that it was an accident. What happened was the steam engine was allowed to build up too much pressure. The boiler exploded, and in the naval vessels, the ammunition storage, the magazine, is adjacent to the boiler because that's the place in the ship with the armor is strongest so that the ammunition will not be detonated by enemy gunfire. So when the boiler blew up, it blew up the ammunition, blew the ship in half, and it sank instantly, right? We, we know that now, and in the 1890s, there are some people who were like, gosh, this really seems like it could have been a mistake or an accident. They have mines in the harbor. It could have accidentally detonated a mine. It, it, simply blaming the... Spanish seems very risky, right? On the other hand, in the political context of the time, it's very difficult to sort of make that case, right? For example, if you were to say, I'm not really sure that the Spanish sank the USS Maine, what would people say? How dare you disrespect the memory of the fallen sailors on the USS Maine? Do you not want their lives to be avenged? Do you not want their sacrifice to have been meaningful? Are you are you the kind of person that would just let the Spanish get away with murdering a bunch of American sailors? And of course, you're like, oh, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, remember, in actual politics, it can sometimes be very difficult to have rational conversations because politics, right? And so if you're the kind of person that would say, gosh, I think we should stop and really have an investigation and not jump to conclusions, 
It's like, welcome to American politics where jumping to conclusions is the name of the game, right? Uh, and so as a consequence, there is this overwhelming pressure on McKinley to do something, to, to not let the Spanish get away with sinking uh, the Maine. And as you might imagine, uh, does the tabloid press cover the sinking of the Maine literally wall to wall for weeks at a time? It's all they can talk about. And of course, inevitably the question becomes, why does the president not want to do anything? Like, what is his problem? A bunch of American sailors were killed, probably by a foreign government, and he doesn't seem to give a shit. Uh, and at some point, McKinley's got to run for office again in, 18, in, uh, in 1900. Like, is he just going to, you're not going to run for office and win if you're not willing to defend American lives, right? Uh, and so into this uh, walks, we might mention, uh, your friend and mine, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and this is, this is Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, this is his moment uh, to sort of to, to come out, right? Roosevelt is the Assistant Secretary of the United States Navy. Now, what can we say about Roosevelt? Roosevelt is an interesting, interesting fellow. Uh, and so, I'm a little bit about Roosevelt somewhere, but they're gone. Uh, and so, well, Roosevelt was born in uh, New York City. Uh, he was born in Turtle Bay, Upper East Side, uh, which is a uh, big business. Uh, it comes from a very wealthy family. Half of the Roosevelt family in the 17, late 1600s, late 1700s, went up the Hudson River Valley and got rich. Uh, bought up central New York State and got wealthy. Uh, his half of the family stayed in New York City and got into business. Uh, and so his grandfather Cornelius owned a bunch of businesses, buildings in downtown New York City. Uh, and you remember we saw this picture, uh, which is of Lincoln's funeral procession. Uh, and that is Theodore Roosevelt in the window right there. So his grandfather was built a building right there. And so uh, Roosevelt was born in 1858. His mother was from Georgia. Uh, during the Civil War, they flew the Confederate flag and the uh, United States flag in the front of the house because his mother was somewhat sympathetic to the Confederacy. She was sort of a, a, a thing. Uh, and so. Uh, Roosevelt grew up uh, during the Civil War. He was a little boy when it ended, uh, seven years old when it ended. Uh, and so uh, the, the sort of defining uh, things that happened in his life, this wonderful sort of idyllic childhood. He had a bunch of sisters. They had this great time playing in the big house. And uh, their parents turned the upstairs in the house to a big playroom. And they would go upstate and go camping and hiking and all that fun stuff. The, the sort of the two things that kind of marked his childhood, the first is that he was a very sick kid. Right? And uh, what seemed to be a case of terrible asthma all the time. He was confined to a bed a lot as a young boy. And he just decided one day that he couldn't allow himself to be the kind of kid who would just be sick. And so nobody was ever able to figure out what his asthma was. They treated it in a bunch of different ways. It was a psychosomatic, it was a stress, nobody knows. But he sort of became kind of, by sheer willpower, a healthy person. He just, he just went out and was physical all the time. And so he hiked, he fished, he you know, swam, he sailed boats, he did all this stuff. He exercised vigorously all the time. Uh, and so he just became this kind of physically strong and kind of tough person. He didn't, he didn't want to be seen as a weakling, right? The other thing is that by the time the Civil War ended, uh, Roosevelt realized that his father had exempted himself from the draft and that millions of other men had gone and served in the Civil War. And Theodore Roosevelt's father had taken advantage of a loophole in the draft law that allowed people to pay $300 to get a substitute to serve in their place. And so Roosevelt was left with this deep and abiding shame that, uh, that the defining experience of his father's generation was service in the Civil War, uh, and his father had not done it, had essentially opted out. Uh, and, uh, and was his father a coward? Well, he did valuable things. He organized all sorts of charity organizations that ran hospitals for wounded soldiers and took care of people during the war. It was very valuable, the stuff that he did. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, everybody had a life, and they gave it up to go serve in the military, and his father didn't. And so Roosevelt was deeply ashamed by this and questioned for a lot of his life, uh, if, if he's put in the same position, uh, would he make the same choice his father did? Uh, would he be a coward as well? So Roosevelt uh, went to college. Uh, he decided he would be either be a writer uh, or a politician. He loved naturalism, loved, loved zoology and animals and stuff as a young man, but decided he wasn't going to make any money doing that. But as a kid, the, the sisters, Roosevelt's sisters, knew that if, at night when you went into the bathroom, you did not ever uh, reach for the sink without turning on the light, because what he would do is catch birds and animals and put them in the sink. Uh, when you want to do taxidermy, he apprenticed as a taxidermist for a while to learn to do it. When you want to do taxidermy, what you do is you, you cut the, the throat of the animals with and you kill them, and you drain the blood out, and then you pump the formaldehyde and stuff in, the embalming fluid into the animal through the veins. So if you were Roosevelt's sister and you go and wash your hands in the sink, it's like a dead bird in the sink. And so you should probably turn on the light and be careful. Right? Uh, he wrote a book, published the book as like a 12 year old about birds of the Hudson River Valley, and he drew all these detailed pictures of the birds, the beaks, and the feathers, which everyone thought was a, was a really good book, actually, if you were interested in this sort of thing. And so uh, as a, a college student, Roosevelt publishes his thesis uh, at uh, in college, I want to say it was, it was at Harvard, he published a book about the Naval War of 1812. Uh, very interested in the Navy, very interested in the, the, uh, the U.S. Navy uh, and ships and reading his mayhem. 
Uh, and uh, everyone agreed that it was actually one of the best books that I've ever written about the War of 1812. Today, in Annapolis, in the Naval Academy, they still teach this book uh, because Roosevelt was the first guy to try to write an unbiased, document-based, fact-based history of the Navy in the War of 1812. And out of his own pocket, he paid for documents to be copied from the British Naval Archives so that he can include that information in the book. Uh, and so everybody thought, and he drew all the little maps of the battles and the arrows and the ships, he drew it all himself. Uh, and so Roosevelt thought, God, I really like the writing, but there's not a lot of money in writing. He was always worried about that, uh, as wealthy as his family was. So he goes into politics, and he goes into the New York State Assembly, the New York State Legislature. Uh, and the first day, by the way, it's hilarious. The assembly is dominated by these old Irish uh, brawlers, these sort of working class guys who got into the Democratic Party, kind of rose through the ranks by being machine operators and, and party functionaries and whatever. Uh, and so these old Irish guys. And Roosevelt shows up wearing a three-piece purple crushed velvet suit uh, because he's this super rich kid from Turtle Bay, right? Uh, and they're sort of making fun of him. So he walks right up to the biggest, meanest looking guy and he says, if you don't show up, I'm gonna punch you right in your mouth. Uh, and so they sort of laugh, and they're like, oh, this kid is funny, you know, whatever. Uh, Roosevelt likes the legislature. They, they pass some good laws. They try to really make the state better. They try to work for the on behalf of the people. You know, he likes the, the sense of being a deal maker. Uh, and sort of, he sees himself as a guy who, who is sort of sympathetic to everybody and can kind of, you know, uh, broker these the, the sort of uh, uh, deals or compromises and so on. Uh, and then, then what happens uh, is it probably the worst day of his life uh, is February 14, 1884, Valentine's Day. Uh, and in the morning, uh, his wife gives birth to a daughter, uh, Alice, they, uh, they name her, uh, and a couple of hours later she dies uh, because she's got uh, what's called Bright's disease. Today we would call it acute kid kidney failure. Uh, and when uh, sometimes when you get pregnant, you can have all sorts of medical problems that can appear as a result of the pregnancy. The big one is gestational diabetes, where women can develop diabetes while they're pregnant, and it sometimes goes away and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the big thing that can happen is you can undergo kidney failure, uh, but you don't know it because uh, when you're pregnant and you have the placenta, the placenta functions as a substitute kidney, uh, and so you can be perfectly fine. You don't have any of the symptoms of kidney failure until you give birth, and the afterbirth comes out, no placenta, you die. Uh, and you rapidly, rapidly get sick. What's that? His wife died? Yes, yeah, wife died of that, yeah. And so she delivered a baby girl, and they were like, she's like, I'm gonna take a nap. And like, it's fine. And then of course, a couple hours later, she woke up and was like, I don't feel very good, and then she died. Uh, because it turns out, kidney failure. Uh, and so that's why if you're pregnant today, you get blood tests. Uh, because if you show the, the, the blood markers for kidney problems, they immediately give you a kidney test to make sure you don't have the Bright's disease. Right? Uh, and if you do, they can treat it, but they didn't know. They wouldn't have been able to attack. And so Roosevelt's devastated. His beautiful daughter, is, she's the love of his life, but his wife, his wife is dead, and he's just bereft. And later that day, in the evening, uh, his mother dies of, the, of uh, a separate illness in the same house. Uh, and so in the afternoon, he becomes a father and a widower, and then his mother dies. Uh, and is an orphan at that point, his father's already done. So Roosevelt just can't cope with it. He just doesn't know what to do. He wrote a diary every day of his life. And the entry for Valentine's Day, 1884, is that he wrote nothing. He just drew a big black border around uh, uh, the page with a, with a marker. Uh, and uh, the next day he wrote, uh, the light has gone out of my life. Uh, and so he didn't know what to do. Years and years later, he, Roosevelt was a guy who was, was sort of into everything. He, uh, by his own admission, he read a book every day uh, of his adult life for something like 35 years. Uh, he read a book a day, 365 books a year. Uh, he was constantly writing letters, learning new things, going on trips, doing all this sort of exciting stuff. Uh, he was always, he was one of those people when you say, you know, how are you doing? What are you up to? Uh, they don't just say, oh, you know, nothing. He's got like a 37 paragraph answer while I'm reading this, and I'm reading this, and I'm writing this, and I'm doing another book, and I'm writing an article for this magazine, and also I'm going to travel here, and my friends are coming from here, and then we're going to do this, and this, and this. And you sort of say, okay, I'm tired. Uh, you know, stop. Uh, and that was Roosevelt. And someone asked him why he did that. And he said, you, you seem like you run through your life. And Roosevelt said, if you, if you run, through your life as fast as you can, and you never slow down, then your demons can't catch you. Uh, you never have to think about the bad things that happen. Uh, and so Roosevelt went west. Uh, he handed his, his daughter to his sister, uh, Mamie, uh, who raised uh, raised her, basically, on her own uh, for a long time. Uh, and it, it, this is him, we went out to Montana, remember? This is him with the Tiffany uh, Fifth Avenue uh, bone uh, ivory handle hunting knife, right? And so, uh, and Mamie was good. I mean, she, she was the spinster sister that uh, just didn't, uh, didn't get married, uh, and so she raised Alice, uh, as it turned out. And uh, Alice, Alice was a very beautiful, very smart young woman, but she had a very terrible relationship with her father. And Roosevelt was sort of heartbroken. He, he loved his daughter, but every time he looked at her, he saw her mother. Uh, and so he kept her at arm's length his whole life, and she never understood why. It took her years and years to figure it out. And so she, she, she had a very, very tense relationship with her father. Years and years later, when he was president, Roosevelt sent to a reporter. He said, I can control the country or Alice, but not both. Uh, so 